So let's look at the other systems right quick. There's not very many as far as the... There is a great deal of other systems, but as far as the EMT class, there's not a great deal of systems. Right? And the good, good news is that we will continue only to look at this and, I mean, the broad term. Uh, I made it. Of course, I was telling the former students last year that the EMT class is much easier than the first year, and it is. Since we get sort of past this introductory stuff, we're going to airway management and the different diseases and things, and then it, it, gets, it gets a lot easier if you keep up with the reading and the terms. Reading of terms, you've got to make sure that you get those two things down. Uh, and it won't be that difficult as we move forward. All right, so we've talked a lot about already about fluid balance. Intercellular, 60%, 70% water, depends on what book you, you read, okay? Intracellular, so the fluid inside the blood, essentially, and the other fluids inside the cell. 70% or vascular, I mean inside the cell, 70%, intravascular fluid is 5%, and then interstitial, the fluid between the cells, is 25%. So the body constantly tries to maintain this fluid balance by shifting fluid around, holding on to urine, letting urine go, so the kidneys is the primary responsibility for that as far as creating uh, a nice fluid balance. Fortunately for me and you, we don't really get into the renal system that much. Uh, we get into some renal trauma and, and different things like that, but not really in the, in the fluid system. The whole EMT portion is airway, breathing, circulation, bandage and splint, treat the wound, protect for shock. So it gets a lot easier when we get into more of the practical aspect of it. Just this aspect of it requires some the, on the testing part. So as we're getting thirsty, as she's eating her popcorn over there, or chips or anything else, what's going to happen is the thirst center in her brain is going to activate. Because chips or anything like that, food, anything that you have to chew up and, and digest, it's going to cause you to get thirsty, right? So here in a few minutes, you're going to say, man, I'm thirsty. Because the thirst center in the brain is activating, saying, hey, i got to have some food with, with, with all this. So it's going to balance it out. Different proteins in the bloodstream will pull... Uh, fluid in and out of the cells, in and out of the, uh, the vascular system, again, to maintain that balance, to maintain good in, uh, flow in and out of the capillary beds and out of the cells and out of the vessels. So when we lose fluid, dehydration, everybody knows what dehydration is, right? Uh, we battle that a bunch in North Texas because people don't drink enough water to so dehydrate it. When we get sick, we get dehydrated, right? Vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, the doctor tells us to drink clear fluid and what most people want to drink? Soda. Soda. When they say clear fluid, they mean water. I don't know why they don't just say water. You need to replace some electrolytes in there, but with uh, like your Gatorades and stuff, it's a three to one ratio. So you, if you drink a Gatorade, you need to drink three times the amount of water that you just drank the Gatorade. So if you drink a 20-ounce Gatorade, you need to drink 60 ounces or milliliters of water uh, to offset the Gatorade. So Gatorade is a replacement drink. So it replaces just the electrolytes in there. You still need fluid. That's why, uh, you know, construction workers and everybody, they get outside and say, I'm thirsty, I'm going to go grab me a soda. Well, anything with sugar in it or caffeine is a dehydrant. It dehydrates the cells. It pulls fluid out of the cells. So we need water here. And uh, you'll see a lot of different effects of dehydration. Either 
the distribution part of it, you have edema, you have other problems where it's just not getting to where it needs. And then the edema or the swelling is when there's too much water or fluid in there due to the, the pressures in the capillaries that we talked about earlier. When we look at the nervous system, primarily what we cover in the EMT portion is seizures. That's probably about the only big topic that we cover that causes the, the neurological system. We talk about the seizure disorder. Now, talk about meningitis a little bit, head injuries. Uh, I mean, we do get into more than just seizures, but not a great deal. Keep in mind the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. Then you have the peripheral nervous system, which are the peripheral nerves, which essentially consist of arms and legs or outside of the brain and spinal cord. But here, primarily seizures. That's what we're, we're speak of. Uh, trauma involves the brain, spinal cord, uh, but it's a, it's a little bit different. A little bit different topic when we look at trauma. Strokes. Now I guess we do talk about strokes quite a bit. Infection, meningitis. Make sure you guys get your meningitis vaccine early. Don't wait till late to get it. Can't enroll in college without it. Encephalitis. This is inflammation of the covering of the spinal cord and spinal meningitis. Encephalitis is inflammation of the linings of the brain. This part here, Seth, that gives you the head. Encephalitis, itis, anything, inflammation. And then briefly touch on uh, ALS and MS. Just a, it's a chronic disease that destroys the neural fibers in the body. I don't, I don't think that hypoglycemia is actually a nervous system dysfunction, but it puts it there. Or low blood sugar, we'll talk about that in diabetes. That's more of an endocrine system malfunction. But if you notice on all these, each one of them, we have, a, we have a chapter on it, like spinal cord injuries, head injuries. In the book, if you've looked ahead, there's a chapter on each one of these. Strokes, heart attacks. So the, we didn't do this last year. We didn't break into groups and do endocrine emergencies or endocrine projects, did we? No. I think after the year before, I, it wore me out too much, so we didn't do it the the other year. It is a good thing to do. We probably do it this year. Where we look at different glands in the brain uh, in the body and sort of do a do a report. We won't do it in here, but I might go back and do it in my first year classes again, where they come up and they report on they do like a workup on different glands. When we look at the endocrine system, does it have a picture? No. So, kidneys, uh, pancreas, we're focused on the pancreas, mainly in diabetic emergencies where the pancreas produces insulin. That's one of the functions of a small portion of the pancreas. The other function of the pancreas is to uh, produce enzymes to break down carbohydrates in the body. So we have a portion of the pancreas producing insulin, the other portion of it helping with uh, digestion. Pituitary gland is the master gland, and it controls all the other glands through, uh, it sends signals to the other glands to do what they do. Again, not a lot of endocrine system emergencies. I mean, there's thyroid, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. In fact, I transported a patient, it's been a while back now, uh, that was having a thyroid storm from one hospital to the next. The other, they didn't have the medicine at one hospital. He was just screaming in pain. They'd already given him enough dope to kill a cow. So uh, he needed the medicine that was at the other hospital. So we transported him to the other hospital. And he died later that day through this thyroid storm. Huh? Makes you grumpy when you have to take it. 
Yeah, so I mean, there's quite a bit of thyroid, adrenal glands, dump out epinephrine in, into the fight or flight when you get a sympathetic response. Dump out epinephrine, allow us to increase in heart rate. So those are some of the, the smaller things that we'll talk about. But in the EMT, we just, it's primarily diabetes as far as we talk about the endocrine system. Too much, too few. The hormone thing is, uh, well, you don't have a thyroid. If you, you don't have a thyroid? Have yeah. When you start dealing with hormonal, I mean, I'm not talking hormonal issues like with old people and hormones, you know, but the uh, uh, hormonal like thyroid and parathyroid and pituitary things and all that, it gets quite complicated. I talked to a guy this weekend that he's got this special medication that he's having. He's having to go to a special pharmacy for them to make. They have to mix it together. They actually have to make the drug there uh, because his, his hormonal system's all messed up. It's making him gain like a ton of weight. He doesn't have any control over it. That's what mine does when it's off. Like if it's too low, I'll start gaining a little weight. Yeah, so you got to keep keep that balance. My wife has thyroid issues, and you can tell when she's off on her thyroid medicine because she can't hold a thought. She can't just hold a thought very long. I mean, she she's like a wand. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> then you get other gap, digestive problems, dysfunctions, rectal bleeding. Uh, GI bleeds, gastrointestinal bleeds, depending on where it's coming from. That happens to be one of the top five smells and the worst smells in the world. It's the lower GI bleed. Poo and blood do not mix very well. Poo and digested blood do not mix very well. It's a horrible smell. In fact, you can smell it. If you, if you run on a GI bleed when you open the ambulance door, you start walking up towards the house and you go, oh, they do have a GI bleed. See, it just smells, it's like barbecue, you know. You drive by so and you, you, you smell the barbecue, you can smell a GI bleed just like that. As soon as you smell one, then you know for sure. You don't even have to ask them if they're bleeding. You can just take a deep breath. It's worse than your throw up? What? It's worse than your throw up? Oh, I'd rather bathe and throw up than have a GI oh, bleed. No. <laughs> yeah. My worst smells go perforated bowel, uh, crispy critter burn, where they burn like the charcoal, and then uh, GI bleed. Everything else is better. And, and the GI bleed. And the burns are you first and second. Pass out from it smelling so bad. Sure, throw up, but I haven't thrown up in there. Perforated bowel came very close to throwing up. On that, that's a horrible smell. <laughs> a perforated bowel is where you have like a large uh, bowel that has a hole in it. And it's exposed to air, so you can so smell like it. Put a bag on it, like a, and don't people like get bags put on like sleeping bags? Yeah, but that's a different thing. This is due to trauma. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like the poo factory opened their door and <laughs> let you smell it, right? But for us, fortunately, vomiting diarrhea is the most dysfunction. You can get hypovolemic through diarrhea. And vomiting, these little kids can get it very quickly. So if a little kid has a lot of diarrhea, that can lead to dehydration really quick. All right? So the, we have to watch that when we look at that. But the digestive system things, just vomiting and diarrhea, <clears throat> essentially, if, if you eat something and your body doesn't like it, let's say it may be bad food or you... For some reason, the body's rejecting it. You're going to throw it up. If it stays in the stomach, 
and it's in the stomach, and it's like, the body's going, no way, I'm not hanging on to this. You're going to sew that back up. If you happen to digest it, then you could get the, the diarrhea from that. And by definition, diarrhea is just the body's inability to hold water. So that explains a lot about diarrhea, right? <laughs> so you lose a lot of fluid through that. You can become dehydrated very easily. So that's a, sometimes that's a true medical emergency. You know, you get so, many, so much vomiting and diarrhea that you can't necessarily uh, stay hydrated. Then the last one, I think, is to talk about immune system, allergic reactions. Uh, some of the allergic reactions, like the peanuts and the bee stings and these different things, are very quick in onset. Uh, I know a person that has an allergic reaction to bee sting. She gets stung by a bee, she has about three minutes of life if she doesn't get her auto-injector in, in her. Anybody allergic to bees? Peanuts? Thing like that. Those allergies, that immune system, that hypersensitivity takes over and uh, it just dumps all this histamine into the, into the blood which causes the vasodilation, uh, drop in blood pressure, swelling of the throat. So you get a lot of things through here as far as these allergic reactions are concerned that are, that are life-threatening that need to be taken care of within minutes. That's why I don't understand with you guys that uh, carrying around your EpiPens, if you have an allergy, you want to make sure that you carry that EpiPen around with you. 